This channel is supported by Truefire. Truefire is an online library of lessons from some of my favorite players. There's thousands of lessons on there. You can use the promo code JNC40 to get 40% off of any of their courses. I was reading an article in Guitar World the other day and I found this thing from Guthrie Govan, what the article was about, and it obviously piqued my interest because Guthrie is probably one of the reasons that a lot of us are interested in sort of a wider style of guitar playing in general, improvising, all of that sort of stuff. I think for a lot of us of a certain age, Guthrie might have been one of the first key examples that we've seen of real fluency in this way on YouTube, right? It wasn't like it didn't exist before this and now we'd seen it done in that kind of way. Um, and of course there've been great improvisers before him and will be after him. It's just that Guthrie happened at a point in time for a lot of people. Anyway, in this article, there's a few things that I, I found quite interesting. Um, he said early on, I was just trying to achieve this impossible feat that I saw my dad doing which was getting through an Elvis song, it quickly became clear to me that the guitar is a typewriter, it's a machine used to make music. So the guitar is a typewriter, that's an interesting point there, point one. And then we get further on into the article, we get into some interesting points that he makes. At any point in time, you have a spectrum of notes to choose from, with the ultimate right note at one end and the ultimate wrong note at the other. It's all about what kind of note you want right now, it would be boring if every note you played felt right without tension or release. It's better to ask yourself at what point on in this gradient is the note interesting enough but not so ugly it will ruin what you're trying to say. I like that idea of weaving around predictable and surprising notes because it's the balance between the two that makes a melody compelling. I'm not consciously thinking on a note by note basis like I think I want something chromatic now and then I'll resolve on a major third for beat one. But I guess processes are happening in the background in the same way that when we speak English we know where the verb goes. We're not choosing where to put the verb, we just know where because that's how we learned. And that's a pretty good summation of how I experience music. To me, it's another first language. Now he goes on to talk a little bit further. You need to learn to enjoy the sound of a scale before you have any hope of using it effectively. In the same way you have to learn how to like whiskey, I don't think many people enjoy their first taste. Melodic minor can be like that, but if you listen to enough music where that tonality is featured prominently, you get a sense for it. The notes stop sounding weird. That Developing that kind of sensibility comes from bonding with the scale and internalizing it. And that's what I wanted to talk about today because it's easy to, to hear a genius like Guthrie talk about some of this stuff and think, yeah, but do we actually really know what he means by any of this? And that was what I wanted to kind of do today's lesson about. So what are we talking about when we talk about hearing a scale, internalizing it, and these sorts of things. So I wanted to show you some things. Guthrie did a video for Lick Library where he specifically talks about the pitfalls of scale shapes. And in that he plays, you know, uh, a loop around A minor, and then shows that before he'd taught a student anything, they were doing... this sort of thing. Just pentatonic. And then he, he says he showed them a few kind of modes and stuff like that. And they'd come back and they'd, you know, sort of regurgitated. This sort of stuff. 
And he was a bit dismayed and said, well, that's, um, you know, why? Uh, and what this kind of addresses is two things, which is that knowing the scales is sort of like knowing the layout of the typewriter in a way. And this is where I thought his analogy of the typewriter was useful. Um, essentially, you know, scales are different layouts for a typewriter. They don't necessarily show you uh, what you need to say. It's just like these are the dots where you play stuff. And that's a, a way that I think we could think about things like three note per string. Um, things like that is is available notes within a tonality, but it doesn't necessarily show you the whole thing. Now, what we're talking about then later on is that he's talking about, well, when it comes to unfamiliar territory, how do we familiarize ourselves with it? And that's the thing where you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater to use a, a crass kind of um, metaphor. So essentially, I, I do think that where you want to start with uh, learning scales that are unfamiliar to you is indeed with this kind of thing. And what you might also want to do is do something like freeze a chord for context. And then there's some things that he talks about. So first of all, one thing that he, he suggests is like, say you're learning the pentatonic scale. What he talks about is like breaking out of these boxes. First of all, to break out of any box, you have to know the box, right? So joining up scales all over the neck is an important thing. So instead of just this, you start to one by one add other shapes around what you already know. So these are all the same five notes. And I'm jumping between them as this is a thing that I know. Now, another thing he talks about, which I think is actually really useful, is starting to associate each kind of box with adjacent boxes by sliding into them. So you could start on one string. and maybe even try the same idea, but below. So that might be a, a really good exercise for anyone who's thinking, right, I feel like I sort of know my pentatonic boxes. What should I do next? Well, have you considered trying to do that sort of idea of sliding between these boxes, right? And so you pick and try and do that as an exercise. So a, a bigger part of that as well is to learn that a scale doesn't just go like that. So you could map out the scale vertically, that's not vertical, horizontally. So that your scales start to become a little bit more joined up. When it comes to things that we are less familiar with, I think what we really need to do, so let's talk about now in the context of something like A melodic minor. For me, what has been an ongoing process over years, so this is not a thing which you just do and then have sorted. This is an ongoing journey where we try to get more familiar with the instrument. So something that is less familiar than the pentatonic scale or the major scale to me, is the melodic minor scale. So I'm going to show you here, You could, what you should do by the way, and I'll talk about this in a second, is find the scale formula, find a fretboard diagram for it, and then try and play the thing, right?
And this is not a guitar based problem, right? Because if you look at any instrument where they practice scales, which they all do, the way that everyone learns scales is in fact by this going up and down the scale. It's just how scales are learned. But as I say, we're learning the layout of this typewriter essentially. And so for any scale, the scale could exist anywhere on the neck. So you want to kind of think about these positions potentially. And so you think maybe you'd add one position or two at a time. And every time that I execute this correctly, I'm acclimatizing my ear to the sound of a melodic minor, right? And don't forget, again, as we were saying, right, there's this idea of the horizontal scale. And all of this stuff that I'm doing right now is literal practicing of the A melodic minor scale. It may seem kind of floaty, it may seem kind of unstructured in some ways, but it is practice and it is hopefully getting my ear to hear the sound of it. You could try singing along as well when you play. I'm not gonna do that. And as I said, with the same kind of thing that he was talking about earlier, where you're sliding between to find your next available note, you can strengthen your view of any one position by sliding to the next one. And increase your kind of view of the scale and its connectedness. Right, so that same kind of concept there where you're thinking, right, what if I took the position I already know and try and join it up to the next available one or the next one below, that's a really solid way to practice this sort of thing. The next kind of thing that really makes sense and that you see in the classical world and in other instruments is playing arpeggios. So if I do this in A minor to start with, or C major, we'd have our C major arpeggio. We could harmonize, we're harmonizing the root, the third and the fifth, and we're gonna move this up through the scale. And if you can do that, what you're essentially doing is seeing the shape slightly differently to if you're just playing one note at a time, you're starting to see these bigger structures up here. And you could do it like this. And that's a, a really good way to try and familiarize yourself with the scale further as well. So arpeggios are a real key to this, or chords as well. And so if I did this in a less familiar kind of key, so A melodic minor for me. See, there's a mistake right there, right? So I'm not seeing the scale as well as I can see the major. And that's the thing, the, the more time you spend within each of these scales, the more you get familiar with the sound.
there's the one that I slipped up on and learn what you know each time you're trying this sort of thing what the arpeggios will be it's not necessarily the sort of thing that you're going to be getting a ton out of without actually being in front of your guitar and trying to work this stuff out And that's kind of highlighting the layout on my kind of virtual typewriter of A melodic minor or G sharp altered. So let's take the concept one stage further and take it to a, a thing that I'm even less familiar with. Now I'm going to say that I think this G harmonic, har harmonic major, sorry, where we have uh, the root, the second, third, fourth, fifth, flat sixth, sharp seven, or just natural seven. This is like a, a jazzier, weirder sounding scale. So I've got the root again, second, third, fourth, fifth, flat six, natural seven, G. So for me, if this is something that I need to familiarize myself with, what I'm gonna be trying to do is first of all, play the scale. reliably and try and get that sound in my head. I might try this in each position. So every time that I'm looking for an E, I want it to be flattened. So this is, you know, super hard for, I think, most people to actually internalize these things. It's, there's lots of aspects to it. You're not just uh, learning where the notes are. You're kind of, it's, you're trying to illuminate this thing across the whole fretboard. It's a real process of um, just constant. Okay, and then we've got another one here. Okay, and another. And there's a mistake. So that's the sort of thing that as we do more and more of this, you start to really hear. The sound of the scale. And hopefully it starts to kind of show itself become more familiar with each time we do this sort of thing. Then what I might do is, as I say, try and join those up with a slide. In that kind of way. Whoops.
so that we're then starting to see the two shapes linked up a bit better. And then arpeggios um, through whatever your unfamiliar scale might be. Where you're following the scale formula. And then, you know, don't forget to also have some fun with it. So that's kind of what I would suggest, what it really means to start to internalize a scale. You start off with these things as like dot, I'll get down to this level for that. So you start off with the dots and you start thinking, right, how does that actually feel under my fingers on the fretboard? How does it sound when I type these things out on my virtual typewriter? What is the sound of this scale? That's kind of step one. Then, because it's the guitar, we have to think about, well, where else can we play this so that the scale kind of follows the whole neck, maybe. Then maybe you think about, how can I join these up together? And then maybe you think, well, what if I took structures through the scale, like arpeggios, maybe? And that, I think, is how you internalise and get to know the sound of a scale, which is, I think, what Guthrie was kind of hinting at. It's not that obvious. And then from there, there is still the problem of making music with a scale, which is not necessarily addressed. And I think maybe where that comes from can be learning other things. Once you've identified the sound of the scale, hopefully when you hear it in the wild, you can start to think, well, that is what I've heard before. How would I take that down? Equally, you might have played a bunch of scales before without ever really knowing what they are. You know, whether it's a blues lick that you've kind of learned from ear or written down on paper. These things do exist without knowing the theory behind them. It's just if this is what you're trying to get to, then, you know, this is how I would go about that. The other thing to say is that, you know, I could spend hours and hours and hours and weeks and months learning certain exotic scales like Hungarian modes or whatever if I'm really interested in playing music that people are interested in hearing it's probably worth focusing attention on the more common sort of stuff right so uh, I've never had to play the harmonic major in a professional setting right um, so would it really matter if I didn't know that? I'm not sure that I've ever heard Steve Lukather play it. I'm not sure I've ever heard really Larry Carlton play it. The things that, that do get played a lot are the pentatonic scale, are the major scale, and to some extent the melodic minor scale, and modes thereof, which are kind of the same sort of thing. It's the same collection of notes. So maybe that's where your attention should be focused, first of all, the pentatonic and the major scale. To be honest, that should get you actually paid. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comments if you have any to help the algorithm along. Um, that's how I think you can go about internalizing the sound of a scale. It definitely does start with just playing it up and down. That's not a bad thing. That's how every instrument learns them.